Hi guys and welcome back to Switch Up. Today we have a review of Travis Strikes Again No More Heroes. This has been reviewed by Chicken Perm himself. Thanks as always to our Patreons and everyone else who leaves comments down on the channel. Remember we give away a free Nintendo Switch game each and every month. Travis Strikes Again No More Heroes, developed and published by Grasshopper Manufacturer Inc. was released on January 18th, 2019, making it the third large Nintendo Switch exclusive of the year. The treasured franchise director Gyoki Suda sorry about that pronunciation, aka Suda51, returned for this installment as well. While hopes were high that this would still be a quality game, I feel the majority were and still are anticipating No More Heroes 3 instead of this lower budget departure of the No More Heroes series. I believe Travis Strikes Again more so than other games is a highly debatable matter of opinion because there are an abundance of points to disagree on. For example, is it actually paying tribute or is it perhaps being a little more lazy? With a title like that we were hoping he would strike again. But does he? Let's find out. Badman, a retired professional baseball player turned assassin, seeks out the reclusive Travis Touchdown to avenge the death of his daughter, Bad Girl. Once he finds Travis, the two duke it out until a video game console in Travis's trailer, known as the Death Drive Mark II, comes alive and, similar to the plot of Mega 64, pulls them into a bizarre, buggy virtual world. As it so happens, a mysterious person, known as Dr. Juvenile, developed the game system which uses death balls instead of game cartridges, taking a page from the classic Dragon Ball franchise. It is rumoured that if someone were to collect all six Death Balls, a single wish would be granted. With this in mind, Travis and Badman decide to work together through the virtual worlds in hopes of bringing back Bad Girl from the afterlife. However, there is something much more sinister behind the Death Drive Mark II that the player will discover as the game goes on. When playing solo, you can pick between controlling the infamous Beam Katana wielding anti-hero Travis Touchdown, or the revenge-seeking baseball bat-swinging Bad Man. Both characters can be leveled up to increase attack power and health, but they share the same experience points earned and charge attack options, meaning you must choose which character to spend the shared experience points on when leveling up, as well as who to equip each charged attack to. Therefore, it only makes sense to pick one character to play as at the start and keep playing as that character all the way through so they get all the power-ups and best charged attacks. This stands true for the local co-op mode as well, because both players have the option of playing as the same one. Personally, after trying both of them out, I played the whole game as Mr. Touchdown. How the game plays is by far the most conflicted area in the other reviews. There are only two out of the seven levels where the gameplay is not zoomed out almost top down hack and slash style with a very minuscule amount of platforming. The two levels that are a different gameplay style are the shortest of the seven and come back to back. One of those levels sees the character put on a VR headset to do virtual drag racing. When racing, you have to manually shift your racer to gain speed, and if you mess up once, well, you lose. There are only four races, but when you win one, you will not be able to win the next until you do a short hack and slash area to get a racer upgrade that makes the next one beatable. I found this level very annoying personally. The other non hack and slash stage is basically asteroids, where you have to destroy a big ship three times and, well, that's it. That level takes about two minutes to beat making it by far the shortest one in this game. After all this, I have to say it is repetitive. All the levels have a boss fight at the end, except the asteroid stage, and these fights are okay. You can collect gold coins and Aztec ones to purchase other video game related t-shirts for your character to wear, but I found it hard to care about what Travis or Badman are wearing when they're the size of a bug for the majority of the game. The only time you can see what shirt you've got on is when you are back at the trailer in between levels and cutscenes. After a round is beaten, the objective is to find the next death ball, so the character hops on their vehicle and is treated to, or depending on your taste, punished by, very lengthy still picture text cutscenes that look eerily similar to the classic Metal Gear Solid communication scenes. They attempt to expedite the plot and amuse the player, I guess. Personally, instead of having to read and click through these story segments, which last anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes, I would have preferred some type of, uh, 
gameplay to get the next death ball. The game breaks the fourth wall over and over in these scenes as well. One or two times maybe it's charming or funny, but the amount it's done just becomes beating a dead horse. I did find the local co-op mode a little frustrating. Fixed camera angles and small screen real estate mean that you'll often find yourself teleported mid-flight over to your partner's location while you continue to be attacked by enemies that are off the screen. Trying to fix this firefighting in the same confined area doesn't alleviate the frustration as it is very difficult to keep track of which fighter is yours and your characters can hit one another with attacks including the specials that stun or blast you away. Overall for me, gameplay scores 13 out of 20. The controls work well, the Y button will do fast weaker damage swings or you can just hold the button to swing the weapon randomly. Speaking of this, it's interesting that the only thing I found funny was unintentional. When testing out Badman at the start and watching him swing his bat when holding Y down while facing the screen, it seemed like the creators have never actually swung a baseball bat or even seen one swing before. For some reason it was just so odd and too funny to see a supposed assassin and former pro ball player look so goofy when he used his own weapon of choice. The X button will prompt a slower heavy damage attack. B is used to jump and while in the air you can use either attack buttons to perform different aerial moves. A does a dodge roll. There can be four charged attacks assigned to a character and once they're charged you hold the L bumper then press the assigned letter button A, B, X or Y to activate. R bumper is used for your special attack when available. Now the only negative in regard to the controls is that you have to recharge your weapon's battery and to do so you have to click the left analog stick in and move the right analog stick back and forth. It is inconvenient because you run out of power rather fast in any battle and are defenseless to enemies when recharging. It just takes too long to get back up when you're knocked down as well which leads to possible knockdown chains from certain enemies which is annoying in any game. But overall the controls are decent enough and they score 16 out of 20. Other than a few cutscenes when doing your special attacks, there are no voiceovers and all the conversation is the usual text with Banjo-Kazooie style noises. <laughs> The filler text scenes are just far too long to be text only and really should have been vocalised. The music was fine but quite forgettable overall. For me I only really enjoyed the last level's music. Audio scores 12 out of 20. Instead of a first person view like in the previous titles in the series, the creators went with a zoomed out almost bird's eye view for the majority of the game. The backgrounds of the levels are very dull and the game looks unpolished overall. Sometimes when I loaded into new levels, I could start playing before the background of the level would actually load in. As stated before, there are a lot of long Metal Gear Solid like communication scenes with just a black screen and bright green text and pictures that was to me visually unappealing. I also didn't really feel the side banner when necessary. Nearly any other HUD display showing just health and special power bar would have been preferable. There was no need to display both characters' entire bodies on the side of the screen, especially when you're not even using one of them. The screen layout and display were perhaps the one aspect they should have taken from another game. Overall for me, visual score 10 out of 20. I have to say they saved this game with its price point. We have to shell out a full $60 for some Wii U ports and other even older gen games, but digitally the price is only $30. In addition to the basic game, two DLC updates are planned that can be purchased separately or together as a season pass. The first DLC is already out as of February 28th and costs $3.99 and the second scheduled April 30th costing $5.99. You can also get the game physically for around $40 which includes the season pass. I was able to beat this one in about 9 hours so it's not the longest experience especially when you consider that almost an hour of that time was filler content in between levels. Itadakimasu. Itadakimasu. Keep in mind though that Travis Strikes Again is a Nintendo exclusive that's not demanding full premium price, which is definitely commendable. Overall I give value 18 out of 20. Okay, so there we have it. Thanks so much to Chicken Perm for doing that review. Overall, it sounds to me like the game was just okay. It had a few interesting ideas, as well as some nice controls, but was let down by a lot of filler content and an overall lack of visual polish. It scores a final switch-up score of 69%, which is a very appropriate score for this game.
Thanks as always for watching and to our Patreons, and thanks to Jason Shannon for capturing this footage. For all things Switch all the time, keep it Switch up. Cheers guys, see ya!